Father, we thank you, Lord, for just being able to gather together to celebrate this incredible event, uh, the greatest event in the history of the world. We thank you for uh, dying for our sins, for being buried, and most importantly, rising from the dead. I pray that you bless thy people and around the world today as churches are meeting and celebration of this incredible event. I pray that you bless your saints. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, at this time, the kids can go ahead and be dismissed. If you were here on Wednesday, I preached on the death and burial of Christ. I'm going to go to John chapter 19, and we're going to pick it up right there in John chapter 19. John chapter 19. And we're looking at verse 28. The death of Christ will begin there. John chapter 19 and verse 28. I wait for you to get there. John 19, verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished. And basically, as he was on the cross, he was reflecting back, knowing that he did everything he was supposed to do. Everything. He fulfilled all scripture. He completely fulfilled the will of his father. He came to do what he did, and he did it, and all things were now accomplished. And I want you to understand this. No man took his life from him. No man. He should have died physically. When you think about the beating that he took and the blood that he lost, he should have died probably before he ever got to the cross. But he let himself live until he knew that everything was accomplished. And then he said, it is finished. Okay? He accomplished it all. All things were now accomplished that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now you notice there the scripture. If you were here in Sunday school, I brought out 17 scriptures from the Old Testament that were filled within 24 hours of the crucifixion. They were filled within that window, fulfilled. The scripture, and that was most important to Christ, the scripture for, should be fulfilled. The tendency for people nowadays is to leave the scripture. You see, what was most important to him was the scripture. The scriptures above all. The Bible says that he magnified his word above his very name. This word is magnified above the name of God, believe it or not. That's what the scripture says in the book of Psalms about the word of God. Today, we believe the things that we're hearing preached today because the word of God tells us, and we believe the word of God. The scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Thank God, nothing more as far as salvation needed to be done. Salvation's plan was finished. The Lamb of God had died. And today we trust that by grace through faith in the shed blood of Christ. And that's what washes our sins away. If you're going to heaven today, you're going to heaven because of the finished work of Christ, the work that he did on the cross. You can't add anything to it. Nothing. He's not interested in our fig leaves as in the Garden of Eden when they sinned, they sewed themselves fig leaves together. He wasn't interested in their fig leaves for the covering. He already had a plan. He shed the blood of an animal to cover them. And here the blood of Jesus is what covers our sins and not just covers our sins, washes away our sins, praise God. If you're saved today, we should get a rousing amen. If you're saved today, your sins are washed away. <laughs> you are forgiven. You are saved. You are forgiven. You are clean. The Lord scrubbed you down. You know, I remember when I got, when we'd get dirty as kids, my mother'd be like, you're not coming in this house. You're filthy. And one day she took a garden hose and she sprayed us down. <laughs> 
And she said, you kids are filthy. Where were you? We said, you know, we used to play in the mud years ago. And we'd come home all muddy and spray us down, clean us down. My mother could clean us up pretty good, but she could never clean my soul. Never clean my soul. Only the blood of Christ could do that. And I praise God when I got saved, he scrubbed me down. He took his blood and he washed every spot, every iniquity, every sin. He cleansed me. He saved me. Amen. And he did that for you. He said, it is finished. He bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Okay, so he dies. He's buried. Look down in verse 38. It says, and after this, Joseph of Arimathea, same chapter, John 19, verse 38, if you just came in. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him leave. He came therefore and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. Then took they the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with the spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. So we see his death. He said it is finished. And now we got the burial. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden and in the garden, a new sepulcher wherein was never man yet laid. There laid they Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews' preparation for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. So he's buried. Now, there's another step with the burial here that I want to talk about, because this is a step that Pilate and the, and the uh, priests and the Pharisees got together, and they said, hey, we got to do something more than just bury this guy. We remember he said he'd rise again. We got to be careful because we're afraid his disciples are going to come by and they're going to they're going to somehow work it that they pull his body out of this grave. We got to do something, Pilate. So what they did was they wanted a stone there and they wanted to seal this stone. So we have the death, we have the burial, and now we have the stone being sealed. And I want you to turn with me over to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew 27. Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27 and look in verse 62. Matthew 27, 62. Now the next day that followed, the day of the preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that that deceiver, this makes me chuckle, they were so sure he wasn't the one. That deceiver, that liar, that, you know, all that goes along with being a deceiver. That deceiver said while he was yet alive, after three days, I will rise again. Amen, he said that. They knew it too, he said it. What were they afraid of? Verse 64, command therefore that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people, he is risen from the dead. So the last error shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, you have a watch. Now that watch is a group of soldiers. And it's been estimated that watch was about 10 to 12 soldiers. Okay. Now we're talking Roman centurion soldiers. Roman soldiers that were, that were expert in war. Now you put 12 of them there and let them protect the dead man's tomb. There's no disciples coming close to there. Believe me. You have a watch. Now look what he says. Pilate said unto them, you have a watch. Go your way and make it as sure as you can. So they went, made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. Now you say, well, how did they seal the stone? I was reading about this. It was a huge stone that they rolled in front of the tomb there and tombs were basically caves that they found and they had a big hole where they would go in the dead would be in there and jesus was laying in his tomb there which joseph of arimathea a new sepulcher wherein never man had laid the rich man's tomb fulfilled isaiah chapter 53 he'd be buried in a rich man's tomb which he was there he was wrapped in the 
grave cloths inside there with a stone on the outside. And it said that they took here the, in history, with the way they did it, they would pour hot wax around the stone, okay? And they would make sure that that would seal the stone so nobody could mess with it. And if anybody messed with it, that, that wax would be broken in that seal. So they sealed it with hot wax, okay? Whether they used mortar or anything like that in it, I don't know, but it just talked about the wax being poured around and sealing it, making it a seal like you would on an envelope, okay? Sealing the stone. So they sealed the stone and there they set a watch. And that's the end. So let's pray and let's go home because Jesus is still dead. Why are we here? Why are we here? All right, Jesus is called, he's called John chapter six. Look what he's called, John chapter six. John chapter six. The end, Christ is dead. Never came back up. No, nope. we can never put a twist to it like that because that's not the way it is. It's impossible for this man, half man, half God, to stay dead. John 6 and verse 66. Look what it says. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. You get that? What do you have in your heart? You have eternal life. Okay? He's the giver of eternal life. Look what he's called. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the son of the living God. <laughs> okay. So the living God had a son and the son is God. Therefore, the son is the living God and the living God just died. Set the stone, seal it, make it as sure as you can. We remember that that deceiver said after three days, I'll rise from the dead. Oh, yes, he did say that. And guess what? You can't keep the living God dead. There's no force on earth. As the song says, uh, the Easter song, there's no power on earth can keep me back. It can not keep me back. Death could not hold him. Satan could not hold him. Those soldiers could not stop him. That sealed stone could not in any wise keep him from coming back. He's the son of the living God. And as he said, knowing the scripture was fulfilled, here's the power of the scripture. You know, there's only one verse in the Old Testament, only one that prophesies of the resurrection of Christ. Now, in the morning, Sunday school, I went through 17, and there are over 25 prophecies concerning the death of Jesus. But only one Old Testament, one prophecy. That's all God needed. One prophecy concerning the resurrection of Christ. And it's found, anybody know? Book of Psalms, turn to the book of Psalms, Psalm chapter 16, Psalm chapter 16, God only needed one, Psalm chapter 16, Psalm chapter 16, verse number 10, the scripture must needs be fulfilled. 
The Lord said this in the book of Psalms. Chapter 16, verse 10. For thou will not leave my soul in hell. Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. He would not fall on corruption. He would not see corruption. Now, as you can say, well, the prophecy of Christ's resurrection can be fulfilled with Jonah. Yeah, it can. And Jesus said in the book of Matthew, as Jonah was three days and three nights, as Jonas, he says, was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, Jesus Christ, his ministry for the underworld, didn't begin until he died. When he died, the Bible says he went down and he preached the scriptures. He preached to the spirits that were in captivity. He preached to those that were there. He went down into the lower parts of the earth for three days and three nights. This is why when he appeared to Mary Magdalene, he said to her, touch me not, for I have not yet ascended to my father. He didn't go up yet. He was still in the process of ascending to the father. So he was fulfilling this ministry on the other side of his death while he was buried. There he was down here. And the Lord says, I will not leave thy soul in hell. Neither will thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Now, you know, corruption comes if we look at the light of the death of Lazarus. Jesus purposely waited to the fourth day. And there he gets there and he tells Martha, thy brother shall rise again. And she says, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Now we find a resurrection in Christ. I am the resurrection and the life. Well, he comes up to the tomb of Lazarus and he says, roll away the stone. And she goes, Lord, no, 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 not now, no, no. By now, what? He stinketh. It's been four days. You can't go in there. He's fallen upon corruption. For three days and three nights, Christ was there. The first day, 24 hours. The second day, 24 hours. We're at 48 hours. And I'm taking this from Jonah. Three days, three nights. The Lord explains, I'm going to be there 24, 24, and 24. And before that fourth day, the scripture has to be fulfilled. I'm coming out. I'm coming out. Thou will not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Something must happen to the body at death after 72 hours. That something within the body enzyme wise or whatever begins to rot and decay. But up till then, corruption doesn't come to that dead body. Jesus had 72 hours to get out. And he got out. Let's go over to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28, verse number one. Matthew 28, verse 1, in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn, toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. Now, this would be, if you're wondering about time, this would be Sunday morning at around 4 or 5 in the morning when it began to dawn. Okay, here they come. Now, at this point, they get there and the grave the sepulcher is empty. There's nobody there, which tells you that he came out of the tomb. And if you do the math, he came out before 6 p.m. on Saturday night because the Jewish day begins at 6 p.m. Okay. We begin our days at midnight, but the Jews begin at 6 p.m. So therefore, he came out before 6 p.m. If he would have stayed past 6 p.m., his body would have saw corruption, but he came out of the tomb. So for all this time, now almost 12 hours, he's out of the tomb. They show up here. First day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, 
there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. <laughs> you know, in the Old Testament, I love the angel of the Lord. If you do a study of him in the Old Testament, the Lord said, I will send mine angel. And he'll show you the way. Mine angel, he'll go before you. And, you know, in the book of Revelation, Jesus says, I have sent mine angel. Christ has the angel and his angel. The angel is the angel of the Lord. Now, it's crazy because how can the angel of the Lord be an appearance of Christ in the Old Testament and Christ here be here? But it seems that Jesus split himself between Christ and the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord comes down there and his appearance is like lightning. And there he is sitting on the stone. And they see him there. Just the power of this. It's crazy. It says, and he rolled back the stone. It says, and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. He's sitting there probably just waiting for them to come. Maybe he's got his legs crossed, his hands folded. You know, he's sitting there like this. I've been expecting you. I've been waiting for you. Now, who saw him first? Who saw him before the ladies saw him? Who was, watch, who was watching the sepulcher? The guards. It says in verse 3, his countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. Boy, what he appeared like. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. <laughs> I, I could just see them just coming. Uh, you know, soldiers really aren't afraid of a whole lot, especially these Romans. They were tried and tested with war. That's all they knew were fighting and skirmishes. They were battle-hardened soldiers. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. Okay, it says in verse 5, And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. Okay, verse 6. He is not here. Come on, everybody. For he is risen. Amen. Amen. Three words. Three words. Christianity is the only religion in the world whose founder is not dead. He is risen. We don't serve a dead God. We serve a living God. Three words are the basis of our Christian faith and have more power than the belief system of the rest of the world. Three words. You give me three words, and I'll take that over any other belief, any other mode of science, anything else. It doesn't matter what it is. I'll take three words over all of it combined. I'll take my chances with a God that is not dead. <laughs> because I'll tell you this. I'm going to live because he lives. And one of these days, we're all going out of here, and they're going to say, where did they go? And I'll tell you, in the tribulation, angels preach. Angels preach. And angels said this. Angels said this to people. He said, why seek ye the living among the dead? They said, why do you seek the living among the dead? The greatest news the world has ever heard came from a graveyard. <laughs> Did you ever think about that? It didn't come from a university. It didn't come out of the temple. It didn't come from some politician. The greatest words ever said were heard in a graveyard. He is risen. Why seek ye the living 
among the dead. Oh, when the rapture happens, we go out of here. They're going to look for us. Where did Pastor Kevin go? Hey, where's Officer Lane? He didn't report to duty today. Why is the power out? Because Ben's not at work. Where did they go? Why do we have to cancel? Why do we have to cancel our, our school today? Because your teacher is missing. For you teachers in here, you're not going to report to duty. You're going to be gone. They're going to look for you. Where did they go? And you know what? As I said, an angel is going to, possibly in the tribulation, the Bible says angel, angels preach. An angel appears and says, why seek ye the living among the dead? They are not here. They're gone. Again, I'll take my chances with a God that's living compared to a God that's dead. We serve a living Savior. We serve a risen Savior. Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, come, see the place where the Lord lay. Come on, have a look. I rolled back the stone for you. Take a look. Look, he's not there. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. They've never found one of his bones. They never found the body. And they never will. And that make you happy. The world just buzzing by the cars. They're all just going about their own business. And we're in here hearing the greatest story that's Amen. ever been told. He is not here. He is risen. You know, it's called forward thinking. We're prepared. We're prepared for eternity. We prepared our souls. We accepted a living Savior as our Savior. That Savior washed away our sins, and he gave us something to live for, didn't he? He saved our souls. He came into our hearts, and he lives there. And the Bible says now that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you. Ye are not your own. Ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. They're his. He owns us. He owns us. He bought us. He purchased us. Praise the Lord. We're his. It says in verse number seven, and go. Go quickly. I want you to focus on that word go. Go. Okay? That's going to be my final point after I go to the next one. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee, and there shall you see him. Lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy and did run to bring his disciples' word. Boy, how happy they must have been. That's the other thing. The resurrection of Christ can turn sorrow into joy. I want you to turn to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. Resurrection of Christ turns sorrow into joy. John chapter 20. John chapter 20, verse 11. Now, John and Simon Peter have already come here. It says uh, in verse 6, then cometh Simon Peter following him. And went into the sepulchre and seeth a linen clothes lie in the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which would be John here, which came first to the sepulchre, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. But Mary stood without at the sepulchre weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher and see two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, woman, why weepest thou? 
she saith unto them, because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. So what's her disposition right now? She's weeping. She's sorrowful. They have taken away my Lord, and I know not where he is. Very sorrowful. But when you meet up with Jesus, doesn't he turn sorrow into joy? <laughs> Think about it when you got saved. The joy that came into your heart when you accepted Christ as your Savior. In fact, some break down and cry. I've led people to Christ that have cried like babies and have, have just wept. And I say, well, are you sad? No, no, no. I'm weeping because I'm happy. I'm excited. I know I'm saved. I accepted Jesus as my Savior and the joy that comes over them. But here's Mary weeping and she's sorrowful. In 15, Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus saith unto her, Mary, she turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and they had spoken these things unto her. Now, what's he tell her there too? He says, but go, go to my brethren. Do we believe he's risen? How simple. All the Lord wants us to do is go and tell the world three words. He is risen. He is risen. How hard is that? That's all God wants us to say. He is risen. Tell the world, go, proclaim the gospel. That's the Great Commission. We come to church today, and we're excited because we know what we're, what we're reading about, what we're hearing it about is true. And we know that Christ has the power to save. Now it's up to us as Christians to take it to a lost and dying world. Go. And when you, start, when you look at the resurrection and you study each of the passages concerning the resurrection, in each of these, the Lord tells them, each time, go. And with that, I want you to turn to the book of Mark. Go. The book of Mark. I want you to turn to Mark chapter 16. Mark 16. Mark 16. It says in verse number nine, Mark chapter 16 and verse nine. Now, when Jesus was risen early, the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. Imagine the change in her life. No wonder she was there first. What's the Bible say about to whom much is uh, uh, forgiven? When somebody is forgiven, the Bible says that they'll love more. They'll love more uh, when someone is forgiven more. She had seven devils. She was the first one there. You know, where are we when it comes to our service for the Lord? Has he forgiven us of so much? She was the first one there out of whom cast seven devils. She went and told them that had been with him and they mourned and wept. And they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. After that, he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it unto the residue, neither believed they them. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and abraded them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, and this is what he says to us. We're all reading it. 
go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. We believe that. The Lord rose again from the dead. And he says afterwards, he met with the 11 and he said to them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. And the gospel is simply this. The gospel is, is that Christ died for our sins. He was buried. And we're celebrating today. He rose from the dead. And that's all the Lord wants us to tell people. Therein lies the power to salvation. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. The world has a choice, and everybody listening today has a choice. Today, wouldn't it be a perfect day to get saved today? A perfect day to get saved on the resurrection morning, to get saved on the Sunday following the death of Christ, the celebratory time when we, we get together and we celebrate the risen Savior. What a time to come to Christ. What a time to be saved. He that believeth. What are you trusting today to keep you out of hell? People will say, well, there are many roads to get to heaven. What did Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There's only one way. You can't earn it. I've heard many preachers preach on the corner and others saying, if you could earn your salvation, why did Jesus die? Why did he pay this cruel price? Why did he go through all this if there was another way? Was he son of God? Was he son of man? Was he both? No other man was that. No other man was born like him of a virgin. No other man. He was different. He was above every man. The Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Today, you can have your sins taken away. His blood is able to save. If you come to him with childlike faith, I believe, Lord, he doesn't want your good works. He doesn't want your religion. He doesn't want to hear about all the things you've done in life. All he wants is for you to repent of your sins. That's all he wants. All he wants is you to say, my way can't get me there. My way will lead me only to hell. The Bible says there is a way that seemeth right unto a man. But the end, it's considered the end. The end thereof are the ways of death. Man's way leads to death. Man's way leads to damnation. Religion will only lead to damnation. You say, but pastor, I thought religion was good. Belief in the Savior is what religion needs to be. Acceptance of the Savior. Receiving him as your personal Lord, your personal Savior. There has to be repentance. And without repentance, there can be no salvation. We come together today to celebrate the resurrection of Christ and that he lives. Is Christ still able to save souls? He never stops saving souls. And I don't care till the day he comes back, he'll be willing to save any soul that comes to him. He says, come. To the soul winner, he says, go. To the sinner, he says, come. Come on, come. Come, come. Come on, come. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. People carry around a heavy burden of sin. They try to carry that heavy burden. They can bring it to the cross of Christ. It says, come, come on. Let me take that heavy burden off your back. Let me take that. I can give you my life. 
I can give you my salvation. I can take away your guilt. I can take away your sin. I can forgive you. Boy, isn't that beautiful? <coughs> come, sinner. Come. I can save you. Every person's got to make a choice. Aren't you glad you believed? Didn't Christ admonish them many times for their unbelief? How many times they didn't believe? You go to a world and the world says, that's your opinion. Well, is he risen or is he not? What think you of Christ? What do you think of him? Well, I'm here to tell you, I think that he's the savior of the world. I'm here to tell you what think you of Christ? Pastor Kevin, what do you think of Christ? He's my savior. He's alive. And he's able to save anybody that comes to him. Come. Come on. If you're listening to this on Zoom. If you're here today, the Lord says, come. Come unto me, all ye that labor, heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly of heart. And I love the end of this. And ye shall find rest unto your souls. Does your soul need rest? Find rest way down in there. Peace. Peace. And understanding and salvation. You can have it. The Lord wants to give it to you. All you have to do is repent. I'm sorry, Lord. I want to receive you as my Savior. Come into my heart and save me. What a better day to be saved than today. If you're listening to this and you want to be saved, the Bible says, call upon the name of the Lord and thou shalt be saved. You can pray with me right now and you can ask Jesus Christ to save you. If you're willing to do that. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're listening today and you want to be saved, the Lord's willing to save you. All you have to do is ask. You can say this prayer. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I thank you, Lord, for dying for me. I thank you for rising from the dead. I thank you for the blood that you shed. Please, right now, take your blood. Cleanse me, forgive me, save me. Come into my heart, be my personal Savior, my personal Lord. Take me to heaven when I die. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In your precious name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, the Lord saved you. And now the risen Savior lives in you. You can walk out of here today and you can say, I'm alive because he lives. Amen. We serve a risen Savior. He is not here. He is risen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come together on this uh, Resurrection Sunday. I thank you, Lord, that you overcame death for us, and that you died in our place to give us the free gift of eternal life. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for all you've done. Bless the rest of the day. Be with your saints as they go and around this world, those that are saved and those that know you, Lord. Thank you for their belief and for their acceptance of you as their Savior. Until we all come together again, Lord, bless us and go before us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.